this afternoon just to warm up my heart to this psalm. Uh, I re-listened. There's a there's a old Scottish hymn tune, actually named for the little town where it was written. It's it's uh, I, I, it's either Cremond or Crimond. It's C R I M O N D. Crimond. It is the it is the classic hymn tune to which Psalm 23 is often set in classical settings. It was sung congregationally at the funeral of Queen Elizabeth. It is a, a formal and classic and beautiful musical setting for Psalm 23. And I like it a lot. I enjoyed it. Phil Wickham, who is writing very good music for the kingdom today, within the last year, wrote a musical setting for Psalm 23. Right after I listened to the Cremond one, I decided, let me just span the centuries and pick up the Phil Wickham one, uh, kind of back to back. It also is, is hauntingly beautiful. Um, and the neat thing about it is these, these lyrics are 3,000 years old. So what's a couple of centuries on this end in terms of, uh, in terms of how we adjust the musical setting for it? Whatever musical setting we have for it, we have no idea what the 3,000-year-old you know, original setting was. The first four words of the psalm in Hebrew translate to Yahweh, the Lord, you see it if you look at your copy, your English copy of um, Psalm 23. The Lord is that is that all caps, small caps thing that you you see in pretty much every English translation, and that is the the translator's way of Lord with standard capitalization is often the word Adonai. It it it's a very common word for for Lord Master. It's a, it's a, it's it's a nobleman's title, Lord. Um, Yahweh is the, the proper name that God has given himself. Um, and here it is that. Um, the second word in Hebrew is the, the, the possessive form of shepherd with the implied verb of being. So my shepherd is the Lord. My shepherd is. The next word is the negating particle. Uh, the not, the, the, the simplest little word. The Lord my shepherd is, not shall I lack. I shall lack. It's a, it's a first person verb. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. It is a marvelously elegant, accurate translation of the psalm. Roman numeral one. And I'm not, using, I'm not using the screens. I'm sorry, I didn't have time to develop for the screens. So, but stay with me. I'll try to keep an outline clear. If you like taking notes in outline form, I'll try to make it really, really transparent to you. Roman numeral one, the Redeemer. The Redeemer. The Lord. Yahweh God. The songs, the... Scripture, the study that can be done on just that name of God. It is, it is rich, and it is amazing, and it is wonderful. I, uh, I'm going to touch on just two aspects of it for the purpose of our study that I think frame in with applicability in the setting of the shepherd psalm. Um, letter A, he is, he is creator. Um, Genesis 2-4 is the first use. I love that, baby. Genesis 2-4. Abigail, it's good, it's good that she's here. Um, remember, the sound of a little one in church is not equivalent to the sound of a little one at an orchestra concert where you just paid $75 for a ticket and you've got your classical music listening ears on and you do not want the sound of a little one disrupting your classical music experience. I don't either. 
but that is not what a little one in church is. Amen. A little one in church is like, a, like the little ones that come to Thanksgiving dinner when the whole family is gathered together and the little ones are, are uh, making happy noises underfoot and the, the family thinks of its future because it hears and knows of the presence of the little ones. That's what a little one in church is. Uh, and, and, and we must never forget that. Um, nobody turned around and scowled at the Millers when, when, when the little one said, I, I, I'd rather go be somewhere else. And it's okay that mom and dad make that judgment. But it's, oh, let me catch you turning around and frowning and scowling at a young family that's got a little one in church. You would never do that. You would never do that. And may it never be done here. <laughs> right? right? Man, I'm in a rabbity mood tonight. Um, <laughs> He is the creator. The first time the Yahweh is used in the Old Testament is in Genesis 2, 4. The Bible says these are the generations re recapping what's been told before in Genesis 1. Um, these are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord, same thing, Yahweh, when the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. He is creator God. Now, Permit yourself to, to zoom out and take that in. Often, when we dive into the 23rd Psalm, we want to get to the shepherding part. Green pastures and still waters and all that marvelous imagery. But we, we, we must not miss that the, the shepherd in this psalm is an unlikely candidate. Now, he can do whatever he wants and be whatever he wants. I don't mean to say that, that, that he isn't a shepherd. I don't mean that we're about to, he certainly is. But it, the, the infinitely powerful creator God You don't, you don't necessarily get to the, the intimacy and connectedness of him as shepherd when you first contemplate who he is. Don't, don't skip the, the contemplation of, of who he is in his eternal creative majesty. Lest you miss, there, there's a bit of a jarring juxtaposition in these four words. It's a bit of a, he's this, and he's this. There's a, there's, there's a whiplash-inducing zoom between creator Yahweh and personal shepherd. He's the creator God. Let her be. He's the covenant keeping God. Yah Yahweh is a, a very, Yahweh implies much about covenant and relationship. Um, we have spent much of our time on recent Lord's Day mornings. Uh, kind of walking in the shadow of the Abrahamic covenant. It was last year that we dealt with Genesis 1 through 11 and the creation account and those things. And in there we encountered the Noahic covenant. So let me step back a step from the Abrahamic and remind you of the Noahic covenant where the name Yahweh is all over that covenant. So last paragraph of Genesis 8 then Noah built an altar to the Lord. This is, this is after the flood. He's, he has come out of the ark. The flood waters have subsided. And that cataclysmic event is now history. And Noah built an altar. This is Genesis 8, beginning in verse 20. Noah built an altar to the Lord and took some of every clean animal and some of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. Remember, he had more than two of those. Uh, the Lord had him remember every seven of every clean animal that was suitable for sacrifice went on the ark, not just two. He didn't, he didn't just extinct uh, animal bloodlines by sacrificing these animals, right? 
Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took some of every clean animal and some of every clean bird and offered offerings, burnt offerings on the altar. And when the Lord smelled, that Lord there is the all caps, the Yahweh. And when Yahweh smelled the pleasing aroma, Yahweh said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground because of man. For the intention of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I ever again strike down every living creature as I have done. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night, shall not cease. Amen. Yeah, amen indeed. God's in charge of all that sort of stuff. Um, by the way, the Noahic, the Noahic covenant, you know, um, Pastor, Pastor uh, David made a very good point Sunday morning when he said, what, what can cause you to panic reveals what you're valuing most highly. And I'm paraphrasing him poorly, but he said something very close to that. There is no question that we are to wisely steward the natural resources that God has made available to us on this world that he has given to his image bearers to steward. But if quote unquote climate change causes you to make panicky impulses and you're, you're trying to live a consistent biblical worldview the Noahic covenant speaks to the issue of planetary thermostat it just does and until Mankind is sovereign, not merely the steward, but the sovereign. Mankind will never be that. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. Now you get to figure out where you land on the continuum of the degree to which you feel impassioned about climate stewardship. You are wrong to live your life as though mankind has not been made the stewards of the resources of earth. Go all the way back to the Garden of Eden and recap that assignment if you doubt it. But you are also wrong to go all Greta Thornburg and lose your mind as though the Noahic Covenant did not exist. And I'm not here to be political. I'm, all I'm saying is if, if, whatever, if whatever news outlet you love most is coloring your worldview more than this thousands of year old body of literature, hundreds of centuries old body of literature is affecting your worldview, call yourself out and at least tell the truth about it. And if you're a follower of Christ, adjust accordingly for what it's worth. That's the Noahic covenant. Keeps the day and night happening, which means all the way out to the earth's rotation. The Noahic covenant is stabilizing the very largest picture. And this is the Lord. The Abrahamic covenant, Genesis 12. Again, we've been for, for, we did Genesis 1 through 11 a long time ago. We started this year at Genesis 12. And, and as we have looked at the lives of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, we have been, we have been in the shadow of the Abrahamic covenant for months. That God promised Abraham, go from your country. Genesis 12, first delivery of this covenant in Genesis 12. Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation. And I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. 
And I will bless those that bless you. And him who dishonors you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Back to the first words of that chapter. First words of 12.1. The Lord, Yahweh, said this to Abraham. He is the covenant keeper. The Noahic covenant. The Abrahamic covenant. The Mosaic covenant is huge. It's the first of the major covenants to have a conditional component because the law of God has, has some things that are very conditional, meaning if you'll do this, I'll do that. If you'll do this, I'll do that. All the way through the, the Mosaic covenant, which it, it, it doesn't state succinctly because it's, it's essentially the entire content of, of, of the law, right? It's, it's God saying to his people, Israel, here are, here, are the, here are the stipulations whereby you will honor me in worship and, 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 and teach my object lesson a whole lot of things that I'm going to fulfill in Jesus. Here's how you can come from being a, a multi-century enslaved people in Egypt with no control over what your culture is to being able to build an actual civic system. And all of these things are interwoven in the Mosaic Covenant. We know from the New Testament looking back that one of the central purposes of the Mosaic Covenant is to cause sinners like us to say, I can't do that. There's too much. It's too complicated. I can barely figure it out, let alone master it, let alone live entirely within it. I can't do it. At which point the gospel says, you're right. But there is one who has done it on your behalf. Galatians says the law is our nanny to bring us to Christ. Our schoolmaster, our pedagogue, our tutor, all of those nuances of English shed light on, on what the language is saying. You were, you, were in, you were in training under the law and what you were being trained to realize is you could never keep the law. One of my favorite moments in the whole New Testament is at the Jerusalem Council of Acts 15. They're, they're arguing, the Jewish Christians are arguing whether or not Gentile Christians can be right with God without keeping the law. Uh, it's, it's a very pivotal moment. It's, a, it's, it's the first big church council, and it's a pretty major issue. Shall we have a gospel of grace for Gentile Christians? Or shall Gentile Christians gain access to the law of uh, to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob by keeping the law of Moses? It's a great question. And in the back of the room sits Simon Peter. Probably, I always picture him with his chair leaning on the wall. <laughs> um, and, and listening for as long as he can while they, they have this argument. And eventually the old fisherman clears his throat. And when Simon Peter clears his throat in the church at Jerusalem, the room falls silent and listens to him. This is... 20 years after Pentecost, give or take. Um, Y'all are arguing about whether you have to keep the law to know God. Y'all do know none of you have ever done it. It's a silly argument. There's nothing there. If you have to, if you have to keep God's law to know God, no one's ever known God. Which is a fairly good argument. Yeah from the old guy. But the law, <laughs> the law just herds us toward the gospel. Those of us who, who, who live in this age with the gospel. And that is the Mosaic covenant. The Davidic covenant. Also with the, 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 the proper name of God, the, the, the name of the Lord all over it. Um, The Lord declares to you, this is in 2 Samuel 7, beginning inside verse 11. The Lord, Yahweh, declares to you, speaking to David, the Lord will make you a house. Remember David at the end of his, near the end of his life wanted to build the Jerusalem temple. And uh, at first the prophet said, I think God would say go for it. You remember the prophet Nathan, he had to backpedal. Uh, Nathan outran God a bit, which is a dangerous business for a prophet. But, but, but through Nathan, the prophet 
God did have an encouragement for David, and it's this. The Lord will make you a house, and when your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. 2 Samuel 7, okay. beginning in verse 11. The Davidic covenant. And then the new covenant. The night before he went to the cross. Luke 22. Jesus, having spent those years with his disciples, lest they not get the magnitude of who he was and what he by right could do. As he took the cup, Luke 22, verse 20. And likewise the cup after they had eaten, saying, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. All of those old covenants function like a funnel. The world of God, the people of God, the law of God, the kingdom of God, all of them funnel down to the new covenant that is Jesus. The Lord is my shepherd. Don't just hop over that in a rush to get to the sweet shepherding imagery of this psalm. If the lost person understood the ramifications of the creator covenant maker who is the first word of this psalm, and they have lived their life in contempt of who he is, they might not choose to have this pretty prose read at their funeral. Because um, he is not to be trifled with. Roman 1, the Redeemer. Roman numeral 2, the relationship. He's my shepherd. He's my shepherd. Inevitably, the Lord is my shepherd just drops us in, in, in the great shepherd discourse of John chapter 10. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. And to him the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he has brought out all his own, he goes before them and the sheep follow him for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow. But they will flee from him for they do not know the voice of the strangers. This figure of speech Jesus used with them but they did not understand what he was saying to them. It seems that he's just describing a fairly typical picture in agrarian life. Uh, a, a sheep pen where at night the, the sheep are herded into this shared pen so that they're not scattered out on the hillside and, and not everybody has to build their own pen. So for economies of scale, a big pen is built. And in the, in the evening, all of the sheep are placed in the pen. And in the morning, uh, each shepherd is able by voice to call out the sheep of his own flock and the sheep know the voice of their shepherd and everyone in his audience that was familiar with shepherding. Now, it was an agrarian time, but certainly not every city dweller would know how shepherding operated, but it would be a common enough cultural understanding that, that okay, yeah, yeah, I get that. Now, he's going to end up with them picking up rocks to kill him. So it's what he's going to say in between. 
some things. Well, let me get there. So Jesus again said to them, they, they haven't understood him yet. Jesus again said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers. But the sheep didn't listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved. So for outline's sake, let's call it letter A, the shepherd's protection. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved. Jesus is the sole means whereby people are made right with God. It's, it's in, our, in our, our culture, which ironically likes to simultaneously pride itself on its tolerance and yet be viciously intolerant toward the gospel. Um, if I hear one more person say, it's okay with me that you people want to be Christians, it's your exclusivity claims. And they may or, not, may or may not use those words. But they're okay if we're Christians until we um, unfold the truth that Christianity is the means whereby human beings are right with God. Jesus is the truth. He is not a truth among many. Can we coexist like the artsy bumper sticker says? Well, it's, it's not the evangelical followers of Christ that burn things down. We've been doing a good job coexisting for 2,000 years. They want to treat it like it's a 21st century trend. But if I love you, and you're going to hell apart from Christ, and I do not warn you, I am monstrously off base. Right? Love warns. Love pleads. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved. The protection of the shepherd. Second, the pasturing of the shepherd. And yeah, I'm alliterating with P's, and if I get to some that feel forced to you, well, get used to it. I'm do that from time to time. I don't think they're too forced here. We'll go in and out and find pasture. Um, many, many, and I, I've never been around sheep. I don't know anything about sheep. But being around the Word of God most of my life, I've heard a lot of secondhand stuff about sheep, and I've certainly read a lot about this psalm. I've never read any author, whether agrarian or or biblical interpretive I've never read any author that credits sheep with intelligence <laughs> now if you've been around sheep and can tell me if you've got a, a trained sheep can, that can do spectacular tricks tell me that story <laughs> but, but, but apparently sheep are, are just not bright um, We, we won't be well pastured if we're not led to good pastures. We will we'll stumble and bumble and fumble without the shepherd telling us, no, this is where you want to go and this is where you want to avoid. The Lord is my shepherd. I have access to his pasturing, his protection, his pasturing. Access to his purpose. Verse 10, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it full, have it abundantly. Now the prosperity gospel crowd runs this verse in an abusive and evil direction. Your life, your abundantly full life may be full of suffering that honors Christ, but it will be full. It may be full of poverty, whereby you will demonstrate that faithfulness to Christ is not tied to this world's economic 
vagaries. You may have a chronic illness that keeps you in, in, in medical distress. And your life may be quite full with that. All of those things for his glory and our ultimate good fill up our lives with purpose. Please do not fall. Oh, the disillusionment Christians have when they claim promises God has not made. Amen. Brother Russell, my life doesn't feel abundant. Well, tell me what's going on. And on we go with a list of things that are not going well, that are causing some grief and suffering. And I'm not unsympathetic to that. I live in the same fallen world you do. And I told a brother not that long ago who was describing those things to me. I said, do you not hear how full your life is? The word abundant here means full. And can you not see that you are being afforded the opportunity to show his purposes even as you navigate a catalog of circumstances that I don't envy. What an opportunity he has placed before you to demonstrate faithfulness. You know, Job, you know what? He's going to curse you when you bring the roof down. Just watch him. What an opportunity Job had as he didn't. Right? His purpose. His person. I'm going to read for a while. Verse 11. I am the good shepherd. I am the good shepherd. Now what he just did is he took Psalm 23 and he put it on his jersey. Because he's, he's speaking to a predominantly Jewish crowd. And Psalm 23 has occupied a prominent place. And you can tell third person stories about this is what happens with sheep and shepherds. This is what happens with sheep and shepherds. This is what happens with sheep and shepherds. By the way, that shepherd that you've been talking about when you've sung Psalm 23 in the synagogues, I am he. I am the good shepherd. And they started looking around for rocks. Now he's going to keep talking, but they have started looking around for the rocks. When he makes that audacious, Jesus makes these audacious, over the top, unbelievable, incredible, I'm going to kill him statements that are honestly execution worthy blasphemy. Unless they're true. And they are. Well, Jesus never claimed to be God. He just did. I am the good shepherd, understood in light of Psalm 23, is him claiming to be Yahweh. Yahweh is my shepherd. I am the good shepherd. You have to, you have to work to miss it. <coughs> we get his person. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who doesn't own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them because the wolf is interested in his self, not the well-being of the sheep. He flees because he's a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. Did he just say that again? He just said it again. <laughs> I, I, was, I was willing to give him a break, but he said it twice now. Yeah, he said it twice now. You got rocks? There's some rocks around here. Good, we might need them in a minute. <laughs> I know my own and my own know me. We can know God. It's, it's almost a bumper sticker. Christianity is not a religion. It's a relationship. But it is. To know and be known by the author of the Noahic Covenant. It's an astounding thing. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. And unlike the hired hand who flees at the threat, the, let me see, 
protection, pasturing, purpose, person. So A, B, C, D. If you're outlining E, price. I lay down my life for the sheep. Rather than run from that which threatens the well-being of his sheep, he stands in harm's way on the cross. A much, much more significant threat than a mere wolf. He steps into the path of the wrath of the Father. His price. And, 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 and not just the Jewish ones. Verse 16, I have other sheep that are not of this fold. Remember, he's talking to a Jewish crowd. And, and, and Jesus intended Gentile salvation, of course. And I must bring them also, and they'll listen to my voice. So there'll be one flock and one shepherd. For this reason, the Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. Letter A, B, C, D, E, F, his proof. His proof. I'm going to lay down my life, but I may take it up again. In, in the Mars Hill sermon in Acts 17, Paul makes the statement that the, the, the apologetic proof of the validity of Christ is the empty tomb. We can chase philosophical rabbits. We can talk about competing ancient ethical systems from which Christianity derives blah, 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 blah. we can philosophize until we drain the oxygen from the room the tomb was empty deal with that deal with that he was put to death by a professional execution squad dispatched to that duty by the Roman Empire he was put to death by people who put people to death every day it was their job they knew what they were doing. He was professionally and brutally executed, and it didn't stick. So whatever philosophical distraction you want to chase, whatever shiny thing grabs your attention on the philosophical and moralistic periphery of religious consideration, <laughs> Jesus didn't stay dead. That's kind of a big deal. <laughs> we have his proof. I have authority to lay it down. I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my father. There was again a division among the Jews because of these words. <laughs> yeah, you think? Many of them said, he has a demon and is insane. If you think, if you think Jesus wasn't making big, majestic, incredibly scaled claims, claiming to be God... If you want to cast Jesus as a gentle, sort of hippie, easygoing moral teacher, drifting through life with glazed eyes and platitudinous niceties, his audience at the time said he's, he's demonically nuts to say the things he's saying. They did not miss the scale of his implications. And he is, unless they're true. Unless they're true. And they are. Many of them said he has a demon and is insane. Why listen to them? Others say, these are not the words of one who is oppressed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? At the time of the Feast of Dedication, reading on, at, at that time the Feast of Dedication took place in Jerusalem. This is another discourse, but it's still grouped by John thematically around this idea of Jesus' claim to be the great shepherd. It was winter, and Jesus was walking in the temple in the colonnade of Solomon. And so the Jews gathered around him and said to him, How long will you keep us in suspense if you are the Christ, if you are the Messiah? Tell us plainly. And Jesus answered them, I told you. Jesus doesn't say, well, I'm, I'm being kind of cute about this thing of whether or not I'm the Savior. He says, I've told you. He's already told them plainly. And you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me. But you do not believe. Because you're not among my sheep. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. Here it comes. I give them eternal life. So the last, the last letter, and I didn't letter on my notes, so I think it's G. I don't remember. Something like G. Perseverance. If you are born again, you will cling to Christ with everything you've got. 
saved people cling to Christ with everything they've got, and that's a good thing. But your capacity to cling is not the strongest thing keeping you saved. You will cling to Christ if you are saved, and that is a good thing. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand, and I and the Father are one. Oh, by the grace of God. Again, if you're born again, you're clinging to Jesus. There may be days when that clinging to Jesus is resolved and days when that clinging to Jesus is more tenuous. There can be chapters of dark, doubt, despair. We can go through the Word of God and I can show you faithful people of God who went through chapters of dark and doubt and despair. Praise Him. He is clinging to you. He is clinging to you. Roman numeral two, the relationship. The Lord is my shepherd and has given me all of those things. Roman numeral three. I shall not want. I shall not want. Letter A. The first thing I would, I would observe about that, that statement is that it is a statement of reality. It is a statement of reality. I, I, I shall not want. Philippians 4, 19 is, is both incredibly assuring and incredibly challenging. In the context of the generosity of the Philippian church to the Apostle Paul, they have given him uh, a noteworthy gift and shipped it down to Rome where he is in prison. And he's thanking them for that gift. That's what Philippians is about. And he gets down to the actual thank you note, part of the thank you note at the end of the letter. And in commending them for their giving, one of the last things he says in the letter, Philippians 4.19, my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. What a marvelous assurance. But it's also a challenge. Finish this sentence. I'll give you a sentence and then I'll give you a partial sentence for you to finish. Here's the sentence that I'll give you. The Lord has promised to supply all your need. Right? Okay. Next sentence. Brace yourself. Therefore, if he does not supply it, it is not a need. Whoa. Whoa. Most of us have lived thousands of miles back from the line where we know anything about need. We have normalized and I'm not blaming us but growing up in the times and places where most of us grew up yes we have known hurt yes we have known confusion in a room this size some of us have known abuse and r real pain I'm not making light of any of that The main TV downstairs where we'll gather to watch big football games and major events is just a little bit larger than that one. The backup TV in the upstairs den. I live in a world where I can say that with a straight face. Just that very phrase. The backup TV in the upstairs den. Do I even hear myself? <laughs> is about that size. You know, I make do. 
when I'm not, when Gail's watching something on the real TV downstairs and I have to go to the smaller den upstairs and watch it on the second TV, it's about that size, maybe a little smaller, but not much. Join the crowd. You know what? <laughs> and I'm going to make noise about need. Lord, I just need. We have to be careful with Philippians 4.19 because in order to apply his promise to provide all our need, we do have to be willing to think clearly about what is a need and what is just a want. There's nothing wrong with wants. I think if I ever meet Ram Dave Ramsey face to face, I'm going to say, dude, it's okay to have a little bit of fun with money <laughs> even, if you, even if you owe American Express a couple hundred bucks. <laughs> you know? Lighten up, man! <laughs> I shall not want. Matthew 6, verses 31 to 33. A whole paragraph about avoiding, avoiding worry. And he concludes it by saying, Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat? What shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? The Gentiles seek after all these things. Your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Maybe not exactly the food you would choose. Maybe not exactly the clothing you would choose. Maybe not exactly the um, drink you would choose. But your Father knows what you need and has promised to provide it. I shall not want. I love, I love the Mars Hill sermon on Acts 17, in Acts 17. We live in a culture surrounded by unbelievers who perceive themselves to be philosophically smart. There's just a lot of that in the air here. And, and the Mars Hill sermon is the paradigm. It's the model how do you talk to philosophically, philosophically sophisticated, or at least self-perceived, philosophically sophisticated people who need to hear about the God they do not know? And the, the Mars Hill Sermon, the Areopagus Sermon, is the master class in that. And surrounded by people who thought... Not only that they were being made right with God by their works, but they thought their works were a means of providing for God. Right? The Apostle Paul makes this statement. The God, verse, uh, seven, Acts 17, beginning in verse 24. The God who made the world and everything in it, comma. By the way, notice he starts with Jewish audiences. He tends to start with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. With unbelieving Gentile audiences, he starts with God as creator. It's a very, very traceable pattern. God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man. Woo, you're going to stand on the knee of the Acropolis with the Parthenon looming on the skyline behind you and say, that thing's got nothing to do with anything that's God. Ooh, give him credit for guts. Nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything. He doesn't. Since he himself, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. I shall not want is a statement of reality. It is, however, also, let her be, and I'm almost done, it is a statement of responsibility. Both are grammatically enfolded, just in the Hebrew, just like they are in the English. Not shall I lack. It's a statement of reality, but it is also a statement of responsibility. It doesn't get as much press as some of its lower numbered peers. The first few commandments get a lot of press. But dangling down there at the end of the list of the Big Ten, in parallel with the more sensationalistic, I suppose, 
the big ones. Don't kill anybody. Don't commit adultery. Don't steal. You remember what's hanging down there at number 10? The Me too. You know, you're being cute. Do you remember what the 10th commandment is? Don't covet. Don't want. I shall not want. Commandment number 10, you shall not covet. That is, you shall not desire to have by means that don't honor God. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey. And if I missed anything or anything that is your neighbor's. I shall not want is a responsibility. Not only do we have the promise of God that he will provide our needs, we have the command of God to not be wanting that which he has not provided. Now that's not saying that we aren't to be willing to put forth effort to improve our lot. If your lawn is dying and you desire a greener and more attractive lawn, get yourself some, I don't know, fertilizer or hoses and sprinklers or whatever there is between your dying lawn and your nicely green lawn, go achieve a greener lawn. That's not covetousness. If you, if you steal the stuff you need from your neighbor's garage, now we're, in, now we're into some tangled up Ten Commandment territory. You don't want to, if, you, if you wish legitimate effort down legitimate paths that honor Christ is not what the Ten Command, Tenth Commandment is talking about. The Tenth Commandment is saying, God, I impugn the justice whereby you have distributed fill in the blank because he's got more fill in the blank than I do. And God, you are at fault for the fact that he has it and I don't and I want it. You just ran afoul of the 10th commandment and you just ran afoul of the direction of Psalm 23, 1, which is a promise, but it is also a direction. I shall not want, okay? Also, I shall not want. Philippians 4, verses, we were in Philippians 4 a minute ago, we'll go back there. We were in 4, 19, rewind a bit to 4, 10 through 13. It was an eye-opening moment for me a few years back when I realized that these verses that I'm about to read teach something that I had somehow spent a lot of years not learning. Let me read the verses and I'll, I'll, I'll share what, what's here and maybe, maybe it'll be helpful to you as well. Again, he's writing to the church at Philippi. He's thanking them for the fact that they've sent a gift. He's under a loose house arrest in Rome and is allowed to live to a standard. He can't work, but if his friends support him, he's allowed to have what they send him. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. He had a love relationship with the church. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I am speaking of being in need. For I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. Did he just say, I have come to be content? Because I read it that way for a very long time. That pesky little verb. I have written in the margin, not in this Bible because it's new, but in Bibles that I had down the years, I've written in the margin contentment is a learned discipline. You know how you learn to play the piano better? And I can't. But I know some people who can. And you learn to play the piano better by playing the piano, by practicing. 
You know how you learn to be content? By committing to the practice of contentment. Like riding a two-wheel bicycle, or playing the piano, or swimming in the deep end. If you're not content, it's not because your circumstances are all out of whack. If you're not content, it's because you have not undertaken to learn the discipline of contentment. I shall not want is a promise. I shall not want is also a reiteration of the 10th commandment. And the direction for the believer is to learn contentment. Unless you think you can't do it. And I really got to finish. <laughs> a couple of verses later, he gives one of the most powerful but misunderstood promises in the whole New Testament. I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low. That is, I know how to have no money at all. He's talking about money. And I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger. That secret, by the way, is the learned discipline of contentment. I can face plenty. I can face hunger. I can face abundance and need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That promise is not that you can run a three-minute, 15-second mile. <laughs> we, take, we take that verse, rip it out of context, and march it all over the place, claiming a sort of universal master access to the omnipotence of God. And that's not promised here. Amen. This verse has a context. This promise has a context. This promise is you too can learn contentment because you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. There are plenty of other promises that God makes his power available to his people. I'm not trying to strip away your confidence in the availability of God's power for your life. But this promise, this promise says that if you've got a spare billion dollars laying around, as hard as it would be, you can still honor Christ. And if you're hungry right now and don't know where the money's going to come from to buy the food you need to eat, you can still honor Christ because you can do all things through learning the discipline of contentment because the Lord is your shepherd. Amen. You shall not want. Amen. All right, let me pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for the depth of this psalm and the truth of your word. Lord, thank you that we are privileged to be your sheep. The privilege of knowing you and incredibly the privilege of being known by you. Personally, intimately, and in a connected way. May we not want in Jesus' name I pray, amen, amen. and good night.